This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 35. Sean and I are back on the map after a couple months of hiatus. And we are here to talk about disability justice. And we're here with a couple folks from both the queer and trans community in Seattle and the disability justice community. Jude and Hell, and I'm gonna hand the mic off to Hell first and have them to introduce themselves and then we'll have Jude do the same. And then we have some questions for you. So thank you both of you for being here. And Sean and I are really excited to learn about this topic. It's not something that we both have a lot of awareness around. So we're gonna be learning right along with our listeners. So I'm gonna hand it off to Hell. Hi, and well, thank you for having us. My name is Helga Bramak. I work at the Q Center at the University of Washington, and I do a lot of education work around anti-racism, queer trans stuff, disability stuff, like kind of a whole anti-oppression shipping. I also am one of the organizers of Writing Resistance, which is a writing and art project here in Seattle for multiply marginalized, sick and disabled folks. All of our spaces are open to chronically ill, disabled and deaf folks, or folks who identify with being on the receiving end of ableism and or autism. And with that, we do writing circles. We also have a zine that's coming up and we're actually still accepting submissions for that. Um, so we're extending the deadline till April 1st. It was originally March 15th, so look out for that. As far as my identity goes, I am multiply disabled, black, Eritrean American, transmasculine, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. My name is Jude. I am a long-term organizer with Queer Youth Space, although I'm currently stepping back in my role with them. Um, and I work at an uh, after-school program called Age Up in the South End. I also am part of a project right now called In Passing, which is a zine discussing the concept of passing across class, disability, race, gender, and the deadline for that is also April 1st, so lots of good zine action in the community right now. <laughs> and I'm 21, white, transmasculine person with a disability. To kick off this episode, we're going to get into some terminology, which is what we do so often here on GenderCast. So why don't we start off with having both of you kind of speak to what does disability justice mean to you? I mean, I think disability justice for me personally is kind of taking things out of this idea of like really medicalized bodies. And for someone who was labeled disabled in infancy, like I've always kind of lived within like these medical systems and medical ways of really thinking about my body, which feels so dehumanizing. And I think disability justice for me at least has been like, all right, yeah, this is what my body is like. It's not like this medical problem. It's just like who I am. And I think it's also kind of moving away from this idea. Of, we only have to talk about like how we fit in medically or how we fit in as far as like rights go or accommodations and being like, no, like I'm a, like this holistic being and I'm disabled and that's just like a part of me. And it shouldn't be about rights or accommodations. It should be about this world needs to actually like take my body in as it is and it doesn't need to be cured. And like, there doesn't need to be like, this extra accommodation. Like it should just be, and it should just be expected. To me, disability justice means moving beyond accommodations and accessibility for people with disabilities to a much larger framework of like changing the way we think about what a normal body or a normal mind is and basically just pushing the boundaries of what is a like acceptable person so that everyone can be included in community in the way that they want to be and people are not isolated based on the way their mind or body operates. So disability justice to me means it's so far beyond just people being able to get into spaces or even the language we use, that's super important, but disability justice to me just feels much wider than that. So moving on to that kind of the next concepts, what about disability rights and disability studies and what those mean to you or how you understand them? I would say that disability rights, on the other hand, um, is about accommodations, is about curve cuts and like, you know, elevators, and it's about physical access, which is really, really important. Like, don't get me wrong, those things are really, really necessary. But it's definitely like, what are tangible things we can do? Like, talking about like the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, you know, like talking about what are 
legal definitions of disability and like how do we accommodate that and that's I think what the disability rights movement has kind of been about. Yeah, disability rights to me feels a lot more about legal inclusion and how disability is written into law and what specific accommodations people are required to provide for people with disabilities. And there are certainly a lot of ways that that can be powerful and that it is absolutely important that, you know, businesses are required to provide ramps or whatever, but there's so much more beyond that. Disability communities need much more than just inclusion or being able to get into the space because that says often nothing about how our lives are actually transformed beyond just the very like basic material consequences for our lives. Kind of sounds like one way to think about it might be the rights are sort of the basic the way that you sort of get support and then maybe are able to survive. But with disability justice, you're talking more about liberation and moving towards a place of thriving and really having a broader understanding. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question that we have is, can you frame disability justice and disability rights historically and disability studies theory? So again, just from speaking from your own experience, sort of what you know about sort of the history of disability justice and disability rights, and if you think of any key moments that are important to you or that you'd like to mention historically around disability justice and disability rights. Uh -huh. So Hel, why don't we start with you and then you can hand it off to Jude. Okay, so I think it's probably best to start with disability rights. Disability rights as we know it kind of started in the 1960s and it was like happening in a very, very political time. Like you had like the civil rights movement happening. You had like a lot of feminist stuff happening, anti-Vietnam, like war, like all that kind of stuff was happening. And so disability rights was also happening. And the way we know it kind of started down in California. Well, I don't know if y'all have heard of Ed Roberts, who was a chair user. He was a quadriplegic and he wanted to go to Berkeley, I believe. And he kept on applying over and over again. He kept on getting rejected. And there's kind of this famous thing where one of the administrators had said, we tried disabled people before and it didn't work. So he, he kept on trying and he kept on trying. And finally they're like, okay, fine, just come. And so they ended up putting him, cause like he was an iron lung user. He was a, a polio survivor, I believe. And they ended up putting him in the hospital ward because none of the dorms would like all the floors were way too soft to like carry his iron lung so they ended up putting him in the hospital ward and it was like under this like idea where like you don't get to use this as a medical space this is just your dorm room and then like <laughs> other folks started to get in and there were more quadriplegics coming to berkeley then it was just like this like little area of the hospital that was just the dorm room for like chair users and people who are, had iron lungs and they started calling themselves the, the rolling quads. And the rolling quads did a lot of stuff around campus where they were like, all right, like you gave us this place to stay, but then like curbs are not cut. How are we supposed to get around campus? And there's like this famous image, or famous to me, I don't know if it's actually famous, I just know about it, <laughs> um, of like there being like this protest on Berkeley's campus. And there was a, one of them was holding a sign that said, cut the crap and cut the curbs. And I guess going more deeply into the story about Ed Roberts, like him having problems with the education system was not something new to him. He had a lot of trouble in secondary school. He did a lot of stuff where he would kind of like attend school kind of like through the phone or like just couldn't go to school because like what do you do when like the building doesn't even allow for your body or like the assistive devices that you need. But he had like a, a principal who was just like, well, you're not coming to school, so we're going to fail you. And so like that was like a whole battle for him. So it was like this whole like continuous thing of people being like, well, you don't get to go here. And, and it's like our fault that you don't get to go here, but they don't acknowledge that, you know, but like, but since you don't, like you're lesser. So there was a lot of awesome stuff happening in Berkeley where they're just like, no, like we deserve to be here. We should be here. And they started like kind of organizing with themselves. And that's kind of the, the beginning of disability rights. But one thing to remember about that is all these dudes were like a dudes, they were white people be like, you know, had some like privilege, I'm assuming around class were straight, you know, were cis, they were like all these things. So like, it's really, really cool what they were doing but it still wasn't all encompassing. And so with disability justice, it's a little different where it kind of came out of POC spaces, poor led spaces, like queer spaces where people were like, no, like we're not accepted for multiple reasons and we're not even completely accepted within like this disability rights movement. And so like a lot of stuff started to come out of that where it was like, no, like you need to look at us like holistically and you need to look at all the different ways in which like our bodies are like criminalized or medicalized or otherwise isolated and sh shut out. And so that's kind of what disability justice came out of, which was like, disability rights is awesome and we need to continue that, but also it doesn't conclude us all. I don't like making complete 
comparisons to like kind of take this with a grain of salt but you can kind of think of it you know what queer liberation has been to like gay rights mm -hmm. you know it's not like it's unnecessary but you also have to be like well like this also can hurt and feel hurtful if like you don't fit into that and you're like okay like i'm a disabled person but i don't even really feel into feel like i fit into disability rights or like i'm a queer person but i don't really even feel like i feel it fit into the gay rights movement and so i think disability justice was like meant to address that and then disability studies which i will talk a little bit about but then i'll hand it off to you it's kind of like the academic side of that, you know, like there's always like people kind of trying to map what's happening. So again, like, you know, you have like queer theory and like gender studies and critical race theory, and then you have disability studies, which is a lot more like breaking down, like how do we actually think about disability and like all these like different models. And I don't know if you kind of want to get into that. So like, I don't know, it's not like necessarily like my forte, like it's been formative in certain ways, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> One other moment in disability organizing history that I think is important to point out, and I think often the one that the most non-disabled people I talk to have heard of is the moment when Gallaudet University got, which is the University for People with Hearing Impairments, when they first got a deaf president through a lot of organizing on their own. And so I think the, just the fact that the two main kind of like touchstone points in disability history are both revolve around university organizing really points out the ways that disability rights has been led by people seeking higher education privilege and people who have access to that in some ways, even though they're, they're fighting for that access, but also they can begin to get it in some ways. So I think that's interesting. To talk a little bit more about disability studies, one of the main points from disability studies that feels powerful to me in some ways is the models of disability. So the two main models of disability that we think about right now is the social model of disability versus the medical model. So the medical model of disability is basically saying that the person with the disability, their body and their mind are the problem. So they have something wrong with them and that's the reason that they have trouble functioning in society. So if you have a learning disability, there's something like wrong with your brain that can be potentially fixed through some sort of medication or therapy and that with the right amount of interaction with doctors and medicine, you will strive towards overcoming your disability and being able to function in as normal a way as possible. The social model of disability is saying that it's not actually the person's body or mind that is the problem, it's actually the way our society is structured. So the problem is that there are barriers in society and that society itself, it's like buildings, it's structures, the way we interact with each other need to be changed. Those barriers need to be taken away to make everyone more able to interact. So it's not that the person is the problem, it's that society is what actually needs to change. So. That's kind of a major framework within disability justice that people use to think about how to work towards disability liberation. So I think we're going to move on to more local <laughs> news. So you both are really involved with doing work around this. So what can you tell us about kind of what's happening here in the Pacific Northwest or more specifically Seattle since you both organize within this area? I mean, I guess we're not free of the whole university thing. So I think one thing to actually look at that I think is going to be really, really cool is the D Center that's opening up at UW. And that's like the disability and deaf cultural space on campus. And so there's like a queer space, there's like a POC space, and now like there's kind of like this disability and deaf space opening up. And I think that's going to be really great for the campus. And I really wish that was something that was around when I was more in school. UW, which is the University of Washington, Seattle campus. The grand opening should be on April 5th at the D Center. As far as like not university stuff, which is stuff that I am way more passionate about, <laughs> there's the DJC, which is the Disability Justice Collective. And like the Disability Justice Collective is pretty awesome in the fact that they're really like queer and about like talking about those intersections. And they kind of do things like have like intentional spaces. Like they had a reading group not too long ago, meet up. I think they're like teaming up with Deaf Spotlight to do an event pretty soon. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. So they're definitely a group of folks to like look out for. I'm involved with Writing Resistance, which is what I spoke about a little earlier, which is a writing and art project for multiply marginalized people. And we're like all about like these intentional spaces for folks to like A, feel less isolated, but be like have a space to like talk about that isolation in a space where we're like, you can be as bitter, as angry, as like unforgiving as you want. Like you can just come in here and be like, fuck all able bodied people. <laughs> like and it's cool, you know? And that's kind of the organizing that like 
I know about and have been a part of. I think, too, that there's a lot of really powerful informal disability justice organizing going on in Seattle right now. And I feel that there's a lot of momentum and power behind that. And what I mean by that is a lot of people with disabilities who are going into spaces that they're already organizing with that are based around other identities that they have and then trying to make those spaces more disability awesome, basically. So... I think, for example, I do a lot of organizing with a group called Washington Incarceration Stops Here or WISH, and we're organizing against the building of a new juvie in Seattle's Central District, and it feels very important to me, like, when we're talking about issues about incarceration, to be talking about the way that disability affects how people are criminalized, and especially people of color with disabilities are often criminalized in ways that are based on both those identities. And if we're not talking about those intersections, then we're not really addressing issues around incarceration and criminalization. So I think examples like that, where just adding disability analysis and a disability framework to work that's already being done really builds momentum for disability justice in general, even if it's not a like specifically disability oriented space. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, and that actually just kind of reminded me about, I think even here I've been kind of talking about disability as like this very physical access type thing, which it is like, like I have a physical disability and that's something that's like very, very important for me to talk about and I don't want that to be forgotten. But I also like think that it's really important to acknowledge a lot of like the radical mental health stuff that's happening that's a big part of the disability justice movement. And Jude has been talking a lot about how often like the problem is seen as in your body, in your mind and kind of talking about there's like the Icarus Project and I think that they have a Seattle branch and a lot of talking about like our minds and like we we think in different ways and that's totally cool and like the Icarus Project has called them like dangerous gifts when we're talking about like mental health and like how that plays a big part in like how people are criminalized because they don't necessarily like act in a way that is seen as like socially acceptable how we expect them to think of and there's a particular case that I'm thinking of and I don't actually remember exactly where this was but it was like a black autistic man who a was profiled because he was a black man but then when he was approached he did not like engage with the police in a way that they thought was suitable and then he was like brutalized for that and you know he wasn't like a dangerous person or whatever like i mean i want to kind of move away from that idea like that's okay to brutalize people for that anyway but just no one knows how to deal with disabled people no one knows like how like to like interact with the ways that our like bodies and our minds work differently and then when that intersects with reasons why we might be like overly surveyed in the first place, you know, like folks of color or poor folks or trans women particularly, it becomes this thing where it's, we have to look at disability if we wanted to like undo all of this, like we have to look at the way that disability like intersects with all of this or like we just can't do the work that we actually want to do. So are there any things or some opportunities you see here locally that you'd like to see organizations take on or a different type of organizing or address certain things? Like is there anything that you'd really like to see happen here? perhaps even with organizations that you're already working with. One thing that I'm particularly interested in and have been thinking a lot about lately, and this comes from a disability justice framework, but is not at all just a disability issue, is thinking more about collective care and all of our organizing and how we can all build in taking care of each other to the work we're already doing. Because so often we talk about self-care and how we're expected to do the work and then like go home and take care of ourselves in an isolated way and like do our yoga or do whatever. (laughs) And first, for a lot of people, including people with disabilities or people with children, like taking care of yourself in an isolated way is just not possible. And really none of us take care of ourselves completely alone. That's just not a thing. (laughs) And so I think disability justice is a really like powerful starting place to begin talking about how we can all take care of each other while we do this work and whether that means having a meal at every meeting or making sure that we're having meetings in spaces where children would be welcome or you know who's going to be the assigned person to check in with someone when they don't come to a meeting for two weeks or like making sure there's actually room for people to talk about where their mental health is that week at the meeting and for that not to be something that people have to like hide in order to participate in organizing or in their job that feels like a really powerful thing people can start doing in their communities no matter what work they do and that'll certainly help people with disabilities but will also really just be good for everyone yeah i think kind of building off of that access should just be like fundamental to what you're doing and when we're talking about accessibility like thinking about it holistically but also thinking about 
the ways in which you could just never know. Like, I'm like a multiply disabled person, but you know, I'm doing this work, but I still like sometimes someone will bring something up and I'm like, wow, I didn't even think of that. And that's because there's privileges in, in ways like I like, experience my body, you know, and like experience like physical environments. So I think kind of knowing that and knowing like where you lie in, in that and always kind of being open to what people say and not shutting down. Like I've had it where folks were like, yeah, the event wasn't accessible, but it was really important what we were doing. And I was just like, okay, like I'm not saying that like what you weren't doing was cool but it would have been cool if disabled people could go maybe like we could have added something to it um and so i think kind of like thinking about accessibility that way and then thinking about accessibility like collectively because like if we're all talking about it and then trying to like pull our resources to make it work then we can make it work because like there's a lot of really cool organizing that happens but then i think it misses the point when like people can't even go and then kind of going further off of what jude said thinking about collective care and thinking about interdependence and like thinking about a like we need each other b like stop shaming people for needing people like i think that's like a big one for me like, yeah like i need people like to do certain things and then like when you shame me for that then i don't get those things done and then i'm like just really fucked and isolated mm -hmm. and so i think knowing maybe you can like fit into this idea of independence you know like again no one's independent but like maybe you can meet society's like expectations around that because like certain needs are like normalized and certain other needs aren't you know so like maybe you can meet that but just realizing that there's a privilege in that and there's like a privilege in like not looking like you need stuff and so i think kind of like checking ourselves in that and like checking the way that we treat each other and being like kind and compassionate with each other can change so much and then i think also just acknowledging the work that people do there are disabled folks doing stuff but don't necessarily get the recognition you know a non-disabled person will put a bunch of really like care into their access information and then they get applauded but then if i do that or if like jude does that then it's just like yeah like that's what you do and it's kind of like it was actually kind of harder for me to like figure out that information because like it took a lot of energy and you know like actually like the work that i had to put into it it was a lot more stressful and like, i wish i could have just been like, sleeping and taking care of myself but instead i was doing this and just acknowledging that like, certain tasks will take up more time or like maybe we'll do them differently and we should be recognized for that and we should be acknowledged for that and it shouldn't just be expected of us to make stuff accessible like, it should be expected of everyone to do that work and we shouldn't just hand out ally cookies left and right and i feel like often that's what kind of happens it's like people are like okay this non-disabled person put access information to their facebook event let's all comment about how awesome they're being but no one said anything about the private message that i sent them asking them to do that you know so it's just like thinking about that Often when you're looking at accessibility and access and often when you're looking about organizing work around disability, there was a disab disabled person who said something that got that ball rolling or has like been doing a lot of that work. And so I think kind of making that acknowledgement first is a good place to start. I appreciate you kind of breaking it down to where people that might be listening in places where there's not a lot of organizing happening, where they can begin to start to think about it. I also appreciated talking about the radical mental health movement. And I guess we didn't specifically ask it, but I think this whole idea of passing and disabilities that are more visible and then disabilities that I think have been invisibilized. And maybe we could have done it when we were talking earlier on, but just this whole concept of what it means to have a disability and how broad that is. And I don't know if either one of you want to speak to that, but I work in the mental health field and the amount of sort of oppressive language and stuff that just happens within the mental health field is astonishing to me and something I've been trying to really be more mindful of. But what does it mean to have a disability and how broad that is? I mean, I think first I would say that there's not a strict definition for disability, just like there's not a strict definition for queer. But there's also like shit ton of privilege when you have things that wide that needs to like be acknowledged. So like you kind of brought up passing privilege. And again, passing privilege is like super contextual, right? Like that would be like, there are moments where like I definitely pass as non-disabled and I need to recognize what's happening. But then like, in a different context where it like becomes very, very apparent when I'm trying to do something that I have a disability, then it, it's all shattered, you know? And I think that happens with me with physical disability stuff, but it also happens definitely like with mental health stuff. You know, like someone might seem they're non-disabled and you know, like there might be like getting some privileges from that. but definitely you know in a different context that might not be the case so i think just bringing context into that and being like well you know a panic attack in public can really fuck your shit up as far as like <laughs> passing and not passing you know and so like there's a lot of stuff that happens 
And so like disability looks very differently for different people. I want to move it away from just thinking about it as like a medical model, like where you like have to have this diagnosis, you know, because sometimes that can be a privilege. Like sometimes you kind of just get trapped in medical systems against your will. Sometimes it can be a privilege to like be accessing that. So like acknowledging that, but then also being careful to not co-opt stuff. For me, it's something that always like annoyed me around queerness specifically is when people were like, straight cis people can be queer like, as long as they have the right politics and like, into like kink and poly and i'm like well that's cool that that's what's happening but that feels really really shitty to say to like someone who's not cis or like someone who's not straight you know the very foundation of their relationships are like, questioned or the very foundation of their bodies or the way that they like conceptualize their bodies are questioned so like thinking about that and like thinking about we can't separate this from oppression i think kind of being careful with that as far as like disability goes too is like acknowledging it's this wide thing and it really is like not a good idea to gatekeep people you know and be like you're not disabled or you're disabled you know like let people identify how they choose but also like realize that if you're taking on a label like where you stand in something or like where you are in something you know like i was labeled disabled but there are all still certain spaces where i'm like i'm super privileged and then also realizing that i know mia mingus has been kind of talking about and mia mingus is like a queer woman of color disability justice awesome person based out of oakland she's been talking a lot about how disability justice has become very popular, which is weird. And it's like weird because it's true, but also like I'm like, yeah, like this is kind of a pattern. Like I just remember like a few years ago, like, transness was going through some weird popularity phase, and I was like, okay, like <laughs> these are like identities of mine. So like, please stop treating it. Like it's like some sort of thing that can just be like a phase. And I think what happens with that is people are like, oh, this is the thing that we can talk about. So like, let me kind of co-opt this experience. I feel like what was happening with transness for me was people being like, yeah, I don't like the gender binary. So that must mean I don't have cis privilege. And I'm just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think just kind of always being careful of what words you're using to describe yourself, but also realizing that it's not this set thing. And I think that kind of goes hand in hand with being loving and being compassionate and realizing where you experience privilege and always recognizing like who you are and how you've affected people and being accountable to that. And like accountability does not stop when you identify a certain way because we're using umbrella terms, right? Like disability is an umbrella term, queer is an umbrella term. And like underneath that, like there's so many different people with different identities and experiences and just kind of always remembering that. I think that that's really important to call out and even us, because we are a more trans focused podcast, I was feeling really kind of nervous and just unsure about even having this be a topic because I wanted to just approach it really carefully. But I also feel like it's something that we need to be talking about. So I feel like in a way we're really mindful that we're not co-opting anything because I don't identify as having a disability and Sean doesn't either. So I think how we approach this needs to be super sort of thought out and intentional. And so I appreciate you bringing up all of those things because I feel like even having like a podcast episode about this sort of bumps up against the very thing that you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize how complicated it is to identify as having a disability because there are plenty of people in the world who have the lived experiences of encountering so many barriers in their daily life based on I mean, many things, like certainly class and gender, but also like something about their like physical and mental health, but do not identify as being disabled because often it takes a certain amount of privilege to want to identify yourself loudly or not as having a disability. It can often just feel like you're adding one more way in which society is fucking you over. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed this too with people I know who have a disability, but are kind of realizing more and more that they are encountering a new physical or mental barrier and are like, shit, I don't want to have another disability. I don't want to have another way in which I'm being oppressed by society. It can just feel like another kind of burden you have to bear. And so just being really careful about letting people self-define in terms of whether they have a disability or not and not making assumptions about what people's identities are based on how you perceive them to be operating in the world. I also think it's really important when we're not drawing comparisons, kind of how you were talking about earlier that, oh, well, that's just like transness or queerness in, in a certain way. So I think that's also really important. One of the things that just came up, Jesse, when you were speaking a few seconds ago that I hear folks talk about a lot when they talk about privilege and oppression and they're in dominant groups is that 
I want to be an ally, but I'm fearful of saying the wrong thing, right? That shame deal. And we don't have a very good model in this way, or at least it's not discussed in an accessible way to like be able to talk to one another in general about how folks experience the world really differently. So what would be your advice? Or if someone was listening to this and is like, I feel like I'm going to fuck it up. And so then I am resistant to interacting with certain groups and it doesn't have to be specific to disability, but I think in general, when we talk about privileged identities, I think that's something I hear come up on the regular about, well, I don't want to say something bad or something that will be harmful. So I just won't say anything at all. So any advice for folks? <laughs> First of all, I'm going to say, like, you are going to fuck it up and you are going to say something bad. <laughs> and I do that, too. You know, like, I fuck shit up. I say stuff that I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. Or and I also probably say stuff that I, like, never, ever will know hurt someone. Mm -hmm. So first acknowledging that and that's going to make you, like, really uncomfortable. And it will always make you uncomfortable because that should probably be the part of you that's like, I don't want to hurt people. So I think acknowledging that and being like, okay, like, there's definitely this difference of power in this situation. And then being like, that shouldn't stop me, though. Like, that shouldn't stop me from trying. And that shouldn't stop me from trying to do like, solidarity work or listen or like, just pay attention and like, interact with folks. Because I feel like what happens is, like, sometimes we, like, feel so much guilt that we get stopped there. And it's just like, no, like, I feel like those emotions are, like, there for you to, like, be able to try to check yourself. They shouldn't be there to completely like, shut you down as a person. And so I think maybe talking it through with other people who are like trying to do that work who also experience that same privilege and being like, all right, I want to do this work and I want to make sure that I educate myself. So maybe I'll like Google stuff or I'll talk to other people. And then like just listening when like disabled folks are talking and then you'll pick so much up. And so I think kind of handling it with care and with compassion again and going into these spaces and being like, I'm going to try to do the work. I'm not going to expect you to educate me. I'm going to try to do this work by listening. And if I fuck up, I'm not going to get really defensive. I'm just going to be like, wow, like I did something that was wrong and I'm not going to do that again. And I'm sorry. And is there anything I can do? And I think for me, it makes a world of difference. Like when someone interacts with me that way and it's like, yeah, I messed up. And like, how can I like make this better? Then I'm like, I actually really want to talk to you. But like, if you're just I tried my best and I'm just like, no, go away. <laughs> so like, I think just being humble and actually your main goal should be wanting to make the world a better place for other people. And if you like approach it that way, then yeah, there still will be people who are like, I don't want to be around you because you hurt me in some sort of way. And just like accepting that, like, I'm sure there are people like that who have felt that way about me and not like trying to like be, but I've changed, man. And like forcing that on them. I'm going to continue to try to do stuff. I'm going to try to always be accountable to the ways in which I may hurt people. And I'm also going to know that I have to be humble in this. And I think that's kind of the best way that I know how to approach it. Yeah, there's such a wide variety of disability experiences. I think even more than with other identities. Often it's not like you, you know, get your degree in disability studies and then you had your like ableism tonsils taken out <laughs> and you're like good to go. <laughs> it's like a constant process of learning about what different accessibility needs are and what language different people prefer and there's always, always, always more learning. So you just have to know from the get-go that it's going to be a huge learning process that you're actually just committing to for the rest of your life. And that that's actually a really powerful thing and a really powerful commitment to make. And I think a good way to start out with just basic conversations about disability justice, or if you feel like you're talking and you know you've just made a mistake, a way I like to approach it is just like, I just said something that felt funky to me and I wanted to like check in with you about that. And if there was a way I could have handled that better and making sure you're taking the lead of whoever is actually experiencing that oppression and not bringing your own assumptions into it about how you should have handled it, making sure you're always following the lead of the person you're talking to about it. So the other thing I wondered, maybe you can point our listeners to a resource for this. For a community that is so obsessed with terminology and how we identify and the words we want to be identified by, we also as a community need to do a lot of work and be better about the terminology we use that's been normalized, right? That is oppressive, ableist language. So I wondered if you might have a resource that folks could go to to kind of get a list of things, because I think that there's some that are more obvious than others, but I feel like that's a huge component, even in school with social work, when we talk about various identities, it's the one thing that happens all the time and never gets called out. When someone says, oh, it's so crazy, do you have any kind of resources to point folks in that direction to take a look at? One of my favorite websites relating to that is Feminists with Disabilities, FWD forward. And 
they have a really fantastic breakdown of ableist terms and they have kind of a mini essay on each that discusses what the history of the term is because often people just say things with that like i know for a long time i said spaz without even thinking about what that was historically connected to and what disabilities have been associated with that word over time. So they do a great job of both connecting the history of these terms with why they shouldn't be used now. So I think that's my favorite resource around language. And I think language is such a powerful thing and ableist language is so ingrained in everything we do. One that I really, really dislike is the degree to which we use words like the weather is really bipolar today or like describing things in terms of specific disabilities when it actually just like has nothing to do with that disability experience or like i'm really ocd about the way i organize my desk you don't actually know what the lived experience is of someone with ocd you just think you like things in order so I think just looking beyond our intent when we say words and thinking like, oh, when I say crazy, like I had a crazy day, I'm not implying anything. Yes, but often when people with disabilities hear that, I just feel funky in my stomach whenever anyone says crazy and just thinking about the effect you're having on other people without even knowing it when you use language like that. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. And so how can non-disabled queer and trans folks do solidarity work with queer and trans folks with disabilities who are already doing organizing work? I think we'll start with you, Hal. Okay, first I would say pay attention to what we're already doing and stop thinking you're so original. And so I would start there. And then just also realize that this is like a lived experience for us. So we're always advocating for ourselves. Like that's part of what like being disabled is. Constantly, constantly advocating for yourself. Constantly having to compromise and being like, okay, like this access need is just not going to be met. So I got to adapt to this. So I think recognizing that. And then for queer and trans disabled folks in particular, I think that a lot of queer organizing can feel really, really isolating or impossible. Like if people are like, let's go on, you know, a three hour march and then we'll talk about what we did at this like really loud bar. And then you're like, okay, there's a lot of people who can't do any of that. So just like realizing how you can fit folks with different like minds and different bodies into like the work that's happening and the best way to do that is talk to folks who experience life that way and being like okay we want to do this thing where we're really really public and we're you know doing this demonstration like how do we do that to encompass other people so like i don't know maybe like have like vans for people to use and that can be like a part of the rally or like having art and signs on display by folks who couldn't make it at all and like made the stuff at home and so there's like a lot of ways in which like we can incorporate the awesome contributions that disabled folks are making and then just like not minimizing those contributions and being like actually this is like really really badass and important because like how often do you see like, what disabled people have to say put on display like that and how often do you like see folks with disabilities being able to be in those spaces so just thinking about how like, that's awesome to begin with and like, needs to be done and is worthwhile in and of itself and then kind of looking at what we're doing already and i don't know it really just kind of depends because like i think certain spaces like writing resistance is kind of like a non-disabled free zone just go away so recognizing that so like being like okay like this is a space i should just not go and then looking at other spaces where people are like actually really need people to do ally work so just kind of getting in where you fit in and realizing like where you're wanted and where people are like actually trying to like, create an intentional safe space just amongst themselves and then once you kind of like do all this work of recognizing what's happening and paying attention then i think a lot of other stuff starts to fall into place yeah, the biggest tip I always have for non-disabled people wanting to be allies is to educate yourself first and don't rely on people with disabilities to do that education because it's so frustrating to have people be like, I'm super committed to disability justice work and then ask 18 disability 101 questions when it's just like you could have read three articles online and it had all those answered and just totally had a place to start with me right now. So that's a really good place, I think, to start for me. And I just want to second a lot of what Hell said about really honoring and acknowledging the work that's already being done and assume that people with disabilities have been working to liberate themselves for a long ass time and they're doing that work the way they know it should be done and to really just support the work that is already there, already happening in our communities and making sure you acknowledge the ways and like support the ways that people are working to liberate themselves. So that was sort of our hope that this podcast could be kind of a resource that people can listen to without having to go to folks that experience a disability and have them be in the education mode. So we really appreciate you two being able to come on and talk about this stuff with us. I also think that there's so much overlap in general with 
queer folks and getting so tired of having to educate people and getting so tired to remind people to use pronouns. And I think there's a lot of overlap and that ideally we will be on our way to being good allies. And I think that it's really important in the sense that it's a lot of work to advocate for yourself, to remind ourselves that other communities and other identities are also having to do that work. So let's help share that load. And I think that's a really good place to start with how we can do some advocacy that's, you know, fairly simple. The other thing that we talked a little bit about self-care and what self-care looks like and how we've kind of been taught to try to do self-care, which is independent. So I wanted to go back to that topic of self-care as well as looking at, for me, it's related to self-care that we have spaces where we can be angry, where we can actually get together as a community and express that because so often we don't get that. And then it comes up at times where it can be distracting when communities come together to do a task or have a certain discussion and there's not a lot of time for folks being able to share their experience and why that pisses them off. And so how you had mentioned that the writing resistance, that that group has a space to be angry and that's okay. And I feel like that is a part of community care to provide that space and a way that we can provide self-care and like really be in touch with us. As a society, we're so pushed to like push that down to not analyze that, like don't be angry when I think it's okay sometimes to be angry and that a lot of productive and good collective organizing and thoughts come out of really being angry. So I wanted to just kind of throw that back to you folks to talk about and where do you land with that and what are your ideas around that? Okay, I'm going to try to touch on all of that. Sorry. <laughs> I should have taken notes. Okay. <laughs> I think, first of all, acknowledging that anger of marginalized people is super fucking righteous and important. Because for me, sometimes it's the difference between me being like really pissed and angry at people or like me just like never getting out of bed again. And that's not an overstatement. Like I'm being like completely honest. So I think just realizing that anger helps people get through the day and anger is a way for me to be like, actually, things are really like messing with me. And instead of like turning it inward, which I think we we're often taught to, like, we're taught to really just like hate ourselves. And so I think acknowledging that the fact that that anger is often the most productive and the least destructive way for folks to do stuff. And then, I don't know, this kind of reminds me of something that's happened to me where I got really mad around disability stuff and also anti-black stuff that was happening in like social justice communities in Seattle. And then the response that I got was like, oh, that person is just so angry and emotional. And I'm like, cool, now I'm the angry black crazy person. And I'm like, and I am, so like fucking like accept that, first of all. And like, secondly, it's like way to just like flip that on me. It's like, okay, like I was really mad about physical access not being met and I was really mad about really weird people not really caring about anti-black racism and then what ended up happening is that that got flipped on me like I was being too angry and then it made me feel really shitty and like kind of scared about the way people were thinking about my mental health which is also stuff that I deal with so then it was just like okay I don't even get to be angry because I have so many different identities where anger is seen as like this scary dangerous thing you know like being like a black person and like being someone who has like mental health stuff going on so it's like very hard to express that anger without feeling completely unsafe so i feel like when people flip it on you like that like that stuff still like just like really really like weirds me out kind of creeps me out and i'm just like okay like what are people thinking what's going on should i like just like tone it down and just be like no actually it's okay like it's okay that your stuff is not accessible like it's okay that black english is the punchline of your joke i feel like when you don't let people have their anger they feel really stuck I feel like there's a lot tied into like honoring people's anger. Like you just really don't know what you're doing to someone sometimes when you like don't acknowledge it and don't like honor it just because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Like if they're angry at you or like angry at a community that you belong to. So like recognizing that and then kind of moving into this whole idea of self-care, which is for some people, it is being able to like embrace their anger and can be really, really isolating when people are like, well, actually your anger, like it's not welcome here. And so it's like, okay, I got to do this alone. And like Jude was saying, self-care is like this thing is like it's kind of like this myth almost for everyone because like we all kind of need each other but like you're actually pushing people out by having this language so i think like thinking about collective care and thinking about how like collective care can look and i think that collective care doesn't mean like i need everybody up in my business all the time i think sometimes it means i'm actually like choosing you like i'm being like i really really trust you so please be there for me and i'll do the same i think too we need to honor more that like anger to me means that I am angry because I 
love you enough to expect more from you and my anger comes from a place that I have higher expectations for you than where you're meeting me at right now and I like want you to make up that difference and I think especially in disability community I'm so rarely in spaces where it's only people who identify as having disabilities in the room that some of what we're gonna need to do together is be fucking angry because there's not a lot of other space for that where I don't feel like I have to take care of people at the same time and like take care of their emotions to help them move forward in their process and sometimes I'm just gonna need to be pissed with people who have had similar experiences to me and that that is a part of my liberation I really appreciate you guys taking that question I feel like everything you both said is extremely well stated and I think letting us have sort of a view into that and how it works for you is really helpful I think that wraps up our questions. I'm really excited to post all of the links and help people sort of get their own education and educate themselves. And if you have anything you want us in the future to share, we're happy to do that on our Facebook page and our website. And that wraps up episode 35. So thank you, Helen Jude. And this is GenderCast signing off. Copyright 2012 GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. body or my soul he just wants to share this body make me whole cause the girl this world does see is only half of me i am not the only one born under this golden sun beneath the surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new Start with knowledge small, takes time to learn it all Learn to live, leave it all behind Except the different and find the peace of mind make us who we are and what we know some of us are scared to let it show let us scream this is me now it's time for